All right. We're... All right. Welcome back to our Friday night Bible study. We have a, a guest uh, leader tonight, if you will, one of our own, uh, Elder David O'Four. So I'm going to turn it over to him. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. We are evening. going to start our Bible study with uh, prayers. Father God in heaven, we thank you so much at this, our Lord. We adore you, we glorify your holy name. You are God indeed. You are our God and our Father. We use this opportunity to call upon you to be with us. Guide us on this story, Father Divine. May your Holy Spirit guide us, watch over us, and put your words in our heart as we meditate upon it and also to be able to discuss with one another concerning your scripture search. Blessed be thy name, Father. When all is said and done, may your name and name alone be glorified. Use me as your instrument at this, our Lord. I'm not going to do this alone, Father Divine, Holy Spirit of God, use me, use me as you watch over us and teach us all, we pray thee, in Jesus' mighty name, and let everyone say, Amen. 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 The title of this study is called Sola Scriptura, meaning the Bible alone. The question is, why was the principle of Sola Scriptura so important for the Protestant reformers? When we talk of Protestant reformers, who was the leader of the reformers? Martin Luther mm -hmm. was the leader. And he had many followers, which is not what we're going to discuss more at this hour. <clears throat> It was a fundamental doctrinal principle of the Protestant reform, Reformation held by many of the reformers who thought that authentication of scripture is governed by the discernible excellence of the text, excuse me, as well as the personal witness of the Holy Spirit to the heart of each man. What did Martin Luther mean by Sola Scriptura? Martin Luther meant through faith alone, by scripture alone, in Christ alone, by grace alone. That's exactly what he meant by Scriptura, Sola Scriptura. Let somebody read for me. Romans 1 verse 17. Say, Romans 1 verse 17. 1 verse 17, okay. That would be me. I'll start us off tonight. Romans 1 verse 17. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written. The just shall live by faith. Amen. Martin Luther was a priest. Basically, when he visited Rome, he found out what corruption that was going on in church over there. He was very angry. And when he came back, he decided to do something to stop it. He found out that people, some priests over there in Germany were selling indulgence. Selling indulgence not by faith anymore. With the notion that they can forgive anyone by selling indulgence to them. Promised remission of sin from, punish, from punishment for sin for a deal of promise remission. So, basically he made it clear to them that is by faith. Salvation is by faith and also through Jesus Christ, not through taking money from people 
selling indulgence for forgiveness of their sins so that they will not go to purgatory or go to hell if they are sin, even the dead ones or the living by forgiving their sin taking money from them now that means they are not depending on Jesus Christ they are depending on their own self alone read can someone read uh, John 17 verse 17 to 23 please what was Jesus testimony regarding script scriptura that'd be uh, Carmen's next John 17 17 yes to 23 please oh through 23 okay yes please um sanctify them through thy word thy word is truth as thou hast sent me into the word world even so have i also sent them into the world and for their sakes i sanctify myself that they also might be sanctified through the truth Ni neither pray i for these alone but for them alone also which shall believe in me through their word that they all may be done or be at, be one as thou father art in me and i in thee that they also may be the be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Thank you. <laughs> this is a prayer from Jesus Christ, that the world may see the power which binds men together in unity, may, that they may believe and know that this is of God who sent Jesus Christ into the world. I in them and thou in me. So, So as Jesus was sent by God into this world, the same way he sent his disciples into the world when he was training them to go to the streets, door to door, to minister and teaching them the same kind, the, about the power of the kingdom of God, which they know not about. Then what was Peter's testimony regarding this? Somebody read Second Peter 1, verse 19 to 21, please. Okay. That would be Paula. Okay. Paula's next. Yep. Second Peter 1, 19 through 21. Yes. We also have the prophetic word made more sure, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Each of these verses proclaims God as constant God, consistent, unchanging God. It is the quality of God that he is faithful to what he is, that all that allows us to trust him as well as our God. Moreover, it's a promise of God to help our God's deliverance, our God's provision, God's strength, whatever it is that you might need, God has given to us, each and every one of us, exceeding rich and more and more. The next question goes for Acts 17, verse 10 to 11. What was the example of the Berean Christians in regarding to testing Paul's teaching by the script, scriptures? And An Annabelle is next on the list to read. Oh, 
Oh, you're muted, Annabelle. Acts 17, verse 10, right? Yes, 10 and 11. 10 to 11, yes. Okay, Acts 17, verse 10. Then the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. When they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. Thank you. As they arrived to Berea, they went into the synagogue to teach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they found out that the people in Berea were much more receptive than the people in Thessalonica. The question is, why was Paul and Silas sent away by night onto Berea? I think they're one of the reasons why they sent them by night to probably to get there as early as possible. That they may go into the synagogue to preach the gospel. So that before all the Jewish people that come, that may come there to interrupt them, before they got there, they will be able to finish preaching their words. There are some of them that doesn't come to synagogue to hear the word of God, especially the disciples of Jesus Christ. They come in there to interrupt them so that they will not be able to hold the teachings they were doing or they were destined to do. Yeah, and I like uh, in verse 11, where it says, is they searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. So as they heard the teachings, they searched the scriptures to compare it to see if it was true. Thank you. Thank you. And as we go to 1 Corinthians 4, verse 1 to 6, why is it so crucial for our faith to not go beyond what is written? 1 Corinthians 4, 1 to 6. Yes, please. Let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by a human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself. For I know of nothing against myself, yet I am not justified by this. But he who judges me is the Lord. Therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the hearts, that each one's praise will come from God. Now these things, brethren, I have figuratively transferred to myself and Apollos for your sakes, that you may learn in us not to think beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up on behalf of one against the other. Thank you very much. It is crucial not to exclude, not to go beyond what is written, but not to exclude insights from other fields of study such as biblical archaeology or history. They may help, help us to understand other viewpoints of the Bible if we exclude them. So let a man so account for us as of ministers of Christ and stewards of the ministries of God. The little saying, do not go beyond what is written, is found in Paul's argument to convince the Corinthians to be one in Christ Jesus. Therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who will, who will like, who will, who will give us the light that is hidden of hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the heart. Then shall every man have praise of God. Let's check First Corinthians chapter one, verse 10 to verse four to 21 also. First Corinthians one, verse 10, and also four, verse 21. 
First Corinthians 1 verse 10. Yes, 1 verse 10. Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Paul is giving them understanding and strength, assuring them that staying together and remembering that being in Christ Jesus will give them more strength and also to be in unity with one accord. So, what is the unity of scripture? Based on our study so far, these past few weeks, the Jesus and the apostles treat scripture as a unified text? Yes. Yes, definitely. Thank you. Someone read Romans 10, verse 10, 3, verse 10 to 18. Jerry, Jerry, you're next. Romans 3, 10 through 18. Yes, sir. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands, there is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside, they have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. Their throat is an open tomb, with their tongues they have practiced deceit. The poison of the ass is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I would say these texts that are listed beneath the question here, these are all Old Testament texts that Paul was quoting in those verses. If you go back and look them up, you can compare to what he see and see where he got them from. Thank you. The ones I have. There's others. I know. I said I, you've got some on there that I don't have listed on. Yeah, there, there, there was. A, I didn't list every text that was listed. I just put a. No, I'm saying you example. have some listed that I don't have listed. Yeah. Okay, let's continue. The Bible writers consider scripture to be an inseparable, coherent, goal in which major themes are quota developed. The Bible is based on divine inspiration. No discord between the Old Testament and the New Testament. New Testament does not contain a new gospel, nor the new religion. The Old Testament is unfolded into the New Testament. New Testament also builds upon the Old Testament. The church will have no means to distinguish truth from error without the New Testament and the Old Testament. Not even the seeds poison. Let some, excuse me, let somebody read uh, Isaiah. Let's see Isaiah as well in comparable. The book of Isaiah 28, verse 16. Isaiah 28, 16. 16, yes. It says, Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion a stone or a foundation, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. Whoever believes will not act hastily. Whoever believes will, believe will not act hastily. So this, all of them, 
Let someone also read the Jewel, Jewel chapter 2, verse 32. They're all incomparable, what we're talking about. In comparison, Jewel 2, verse 32. Skip. Skip Ellen, didn't I? Ellen, I skipped right over you. Sorry about that. That's okay. I came in a little late, so that, um, okay. Um, I, I didn't hear which verse we're reading next. Uh, Joel, well, two Joel verse two, uh, or chapter, chapter two, verse thirty-two. Okay. Okay, I got that right here. Um, and it shall come to pass. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered, for in the Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be delivered, as the Lord hath said, and in the remnant who the Lord shall call. Okay, we have more scriptures to read in comparison to see what Paul was teaching about the unity of scripture. Isaiah 52, verse 7. Someone read that, please. Carmen? Yeah. Isaiah 52. And someone ready to read Nahum 1, verse 15. Nahum would be Paula. Okay, so Isaiah 52, verse 7. Yes, ma'am. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publish peace, that bringeth good tidings of good, that publishes salvation, that saith unto Zion, thy God reigneth. Amen. Nahum 1.15. Okay. Behold on the mountains the feet of him who brings good tidings, who proclaims peace. O Judah, keep your appointed feasts, perform your vows, for the wicked one shall no more pass through you. He is utterly cut off. Thank you. Comparing this with Isaiah, those stating the same thing, how the scripture is in unity. Then let's check Isaiah 53 verse 1, and someone else, Psalms 19 verse 4. Annabella would be Isaiah 53 1, and Nicole's got Psalms. Who has believed our report? Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Thank you. Psalms 19, verse 4. Their light has gone out through all the earth and the words to the end of the world. And then he has set a tabernacle for the sun. Um, then someone had checked First Kings 18 verse 10. That'd be Jerry. Okay. First Kings 18. As the Lord your God lives, there is no nation or kingdom where my master has not sent someone to hunt for you. And when they said he is not here, he took an oath from the kingdom or nation that he could not find you. Um. Now let's see what the second Peter says about what can we learn from Peter about his view of the Bible as an inspired whole. Second Peter 3 verse 1 to 16. What can we learn from Peter about his view of the Bible as an inspired whole? All right, I'll, I'll read this one. It says, Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle, in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of a reminder, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets, and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lust, 
and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this, they willfully forget that by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of water and in the water by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, without, without spot and blameless. And consider that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you. As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of things in which are some things hard to understand, untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they do also the rest of the scriptures. Thank you, sir. In summary of the unity of the scripture, Apostle Paul says it is profitable for several things, such as doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness. Then let's see what Paul also talks about the same unity with Timothy. 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 to 17. How does this testimony of Paul to Timothy imply the unity of all portions of the Bible? All right. Ellen, if you want to read that one. Oh, actually, I didn't pull it up. So if somebody's got it, it'd probably be better. Okay. Uh, well, Carmen, can, can, can we go back? Did yeah. we actually discuss what we can learn from Peter about his view of the Bible? You know, he covered a myriad of things from knowing Christ and getting the word and learning about God and the prophets as well as all the way to the end times of what we should be doing and that the, the view of the Bible was inspired from the beginning all the way through the end. And he just, you know, put point after point after point after point in those verses, you know, that Bob read and, uh, you know, you can see as you read those verses that it started out, you know, with what we've been taught, what the prophets have say that the Old Testament was inspired and it goes on through the New Testament and what will ha happen in the latter days. So we can see that the Bible as a whole was inspired from what we have learned and what we see now and what we expect in the future. 
Wow, yeah. you, you, you actually read the whole book. We're not reading it word for word, but you pretty much read Second Timothy 3, 16, <laughs> Yeah. Then in uh, Second Peter, the one I just read, in verse 16, Peter actually equates Paul's writings with Scripture. He right. put them on the same level. So that yeah. tells you that Peter considered the New Testament author to also be scripture. Okay, let's also talk about uh, the Apostle Paul thoughts, how the scriptures bless our lives. Saying that all scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. The same way he talked to Timothy, that the, so that the man of God may be perfect through furnished unto all good, good work. So that's his testimony in summarizing also to state that the scriptures are totally in unity, inspired of God. Then what should we do when we come across Bible text or ideas that appear to contradict each other? So what do we do I when we come needs, across Bible text or need ideas to, need that to appear look at to the whole, contradict each other? Okay. Need to look at uh, the whole picture. Sometimes people will take a text and they'll see that they just read the text and not the context around the text. Um, so you need to look at, okay, who wrote this? Who did they write it to? What was the situation? Um, you know, it's like when people, they take the, the parable that Jesus tells of uh, the poor man and Lazarus, you know, where it has, uh, you know, the poor man in, Abraham's bosom and all that. And they said, well, that's showing that the dead go straight to heaven or straight to hell, which is not the point at all. Uh, and it's obviously a parable because I don't think anyone thinks that we're all going to get crammed into Abraham's bosom when we get to heaven because that would be real uncomfortable. But, um, but yeah, you have to compare it to the rest of scripture to make sure that you're not distorting what you're reading. Yes, um, what you're saying is true. You have to read it thoroughly to be able to compare and contrast. Now we talk about the clarity of the scripture. We talked about the unity, and now we're going to talk about the clarity of scripture. What does Jesus repeated referral to scripture imply regarding the clarity of his message? Would like for someone to read for us Matthew 21 verse 42. Yeah, Next person read uh, 19 verse 4. We are going to compare. Another person read 22 verse 31 and 24 verse 15. Matthew 21 verse 42. That'd be Carmen. Would you like me to read that one? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, Ellen, you can go ahead and read that because you didn't get to read the Second Timothy. Um, Yeshua said to them, haven't you ever read in the Hanukkah, the very rock which the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This has come from Adonai, and in our eyes, it is amazing. Amen. And want someone else to read 12, Matthew 19 verse 4. Oh, 19 verse 4, that'd be Carmen. Oh, 19 through 4. Okay, 19 verse 4. Is that 12? Hang on a second. 19. Matthew 19 verse 4. And he answered and said unto them, have ye not read 
that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female. Thank you. Now let's go to the book of Mark 12 verse 10. Next person 13 verse 14. And next okay. person Luke 6 verse 3 to 4. So Paula's got Mark 12, 10. Annabella, Mark 13, 14, and then Nicole's got Luke. Okay, I'm reading Mark 12, 10, and it says, have you not read the scripture? The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Here. Mark 13, 14, right? Is it Mark 13, 14? Uh, yes. yes. That's correct. Okay. So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel, the prophet, standing where it ought not, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountain. Hmm. So when it's Luke 6, verse 3 to 4. But Jesus answering them said, have you not even read this, what David did when he was hungry, he and those who were with him, how he went into the house of God, took and ate the show bread, and also gave some to those with him, which is not lawful for any but the priests to eat. Okay, since we are looking for the clarity, the Bible is clear in what it teaches. The Bible basically teaches teachings can be understood by all believers. That's when we are reading the Bible by ourselves, trying to understand the teachings of Jesus Christ or the apostles. The Bible assumes the priesthood of all believers rather than restrict, restricting its interpretation to itself the select few, such as the clerical priesthood. Every believer is encouraged in the Bible to study the scripture for ourselves. Sometimes we may come across texts we, which may not be understood by us. Then pray and ask the Holy Spirit of God to teach you. He's the greatest teacher. Yeah. We are human, not God. When you read the same text later in the day, or maybe after a few days, pray over it and ask the Holy Spirit of God to teach you. It will be much clearer to you. Maybe you have experienced it, that you can give it in your testimony. Something you read last night, you could not understand it. But when you pray about it, ask God, the Holy Spirit to teach you. Next time you read it, it will be like, oh, now the clarity will fall in, fall in place. <laughs> so next time you will not doubt if the scripture is clear or not. You cannot study the scripture the way we read uh, novels. No. <laughs> we can only read it by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God to teach us so that we may be able to read it and understand it, even get the full interpretation. You will think when you hear there, you will know. Now, while we may not comprehend every thought expressed in the Bible, why is it, why is it important to realize that a clear message is evident in the word of God? When it happens to that, all we do is to turn to prayer because it is the most personal way to experience God, to encounter him and to grow in knowledge of him as well. Mm -hmm. According to the book of Ephesians, Ephesians 6 verse 18 says, God so desire us for us, desire for us to pray on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. Ephesians 6 verse 18 will encourage each and every one of us to do that. 
Now the question is scripture, scripture interprets scripture. If you believe that scripture can interpret scripture, that's fine. That is what we're doing here to understand the way to interpret the scripture, not to be able to be fooled by anybody. So according to the book of Luke, somebody read Luke 24 verse 27. And Jerry? And how does Jesus refer to scripture to explain who he is? What does this teach us about how we can use scripture to interpret scripture? Luke 24, 27. That's 27, yes. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Thank you. The idea of letting scripture interpret scripture is that he shares for the light on his own meaning. According to the Apostle Paul in the Bible, he says that everything that was written in the past was written to teach us something. When we compare scripture with scripture, it is important to do do it thoroughly, not taking it haphazard or taking one end to the, or, or the other without searching it thoroughly, even with the Bible translation faithfully. And the word, who is Jesus? That's the question. Who is Jesus? In Christianity, Jesus is the Son of God. He is God. He is God the Son, the second person in the, in, the, in the Trinity. He is believed to be a Jewish Messiah, prophesied in the Hebrew Bible of Old Testament. Especially if you look in the book of Isaiah, you will find that it's fact. Let someone read the book of Romans 15 verse 4, please. What is the message of the message for us in this text? Book of Romans 15, verse 4. Right, this, this would be Ellen's text. While she's looking that up on the previous question, I would just like to say uh, for those of you who may be watching, uh, who have not, you know, done a whole lot of Bible study, if you're a little confused on a subject, if you have, have a concordance, and many Bibles have it in the back of the Bible. You can look up the subject and it'll give you different text on that subject so you can go back and find text to compare. So for a person who's new to Bible study, that's an easy way to compare scripture with scripture to help help figure out what it's saying. Thank you, Elder. Right. So for everything written in the past was rewritten to teach us so that with the encouragement of the Tanaka, we might patiently hold on our hope. Thank you. In such in the scripture, we find how hopes were fulfilled in the lives of ancient men and women. It is scripture that gives us the encouragement to press on for the upward call of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord, so that through patience, we will be able to be encouraged and endure. Now, how do these texts relate to each other to help us understand what the texts are saying? And somebody read for us the book of Mark 9, verse 2. Okay, I've got uh, Mark 9, 2. Yes, sir. It says, now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up on a high mountain apart by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. Okay, Romans 12, verse 2, and the next person, 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18. Right, so Carmen's got Romans 12, 2, and then Paula, 2 Corinthians 3, 18. Thank you, sir. Romans 12, 
verse two, and be not conformed to this world, be, but, ye, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may pr prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Second Corinthians 3.18. Oh. oh, you know what? I think Tala dropped off. I don't see her. Okay. Well, she can't read it if she's not there. So we'll go to. You can read it. I can read it. You can read it. Okay, go ahead. Carmen will read that. Second Corinthians 3, 18. 8 but we all with open face beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the spirit of the Lord. Ma'am. So how do these texts relate to each other to help us understand what the texts are saying? All these three different texts we read here now, talking about the transfiguration message support. The message supports the identity of Jesus Christ as the Son of God, as in his also baptism, when he came to John the Baptist to be baptized. Did John recognize him? How did John recognize him as the Son of God? Has already been revealed to John the Baptist how to recognize Jesus when he sees it. I mean, how to recognize Jesus. John the Baptist saw the Spirit of God oh, like God. a dog. Yeah. Well, he saw him as a, when he was transfigured with uh, Peter and James. And then when you go to Revelation, and Revelation 1, where he appears before John uh, in a, a glorious form. And so John recognizes that similarity between the transfigured and what he was seeing in vision. That he was. God, the Son of God. Thank you. That the message of configuration also identifies Jesus as the messenger and mouthpiece of God Himself. Why is it important to ask what other light does the Bible shed on this topic? The same topic of transfiguration. What is it, why is it important to ask, what other light does the Bible shed on this topic? Well, it, it also talks about how we yes. can be transformed, right. mm -hmm. become more like Christ. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's, uh, yeah. it, that should be something we're all striving to do. Right. And when we are changed, we will be like Christ. Um, and also during the transfiguration, we should remember that Moses and Elijah did appear. Yes. Standing beside Jesus. And this symbolizes that Jesus is their successor and fulfilled both. He's also now bringing a new covenant from God for all people. The whole world. When God's voice is heard, he is reassuring the disciples that even though Jesus must suffer, they must listen also to him and obey his command. Now we go to the point says, Stola Scriptura, a non-canonical prophet. Yes, 
And we named some true prophets of God who did not make any written contributions to the Bible. There was, yeah. Oh, there's quite a few. Nathan yeah. pops to mind. Nathan? Yeah, yeah. there's no book in Nathan, but yeah. you know, he, he was a prophet to David. Oh, yeah. Um, Remember the story about the, the man with one sheep? Yes. <laughs> story of who? Well, remember when uh, after David had his, uh, his, affair. His, his affair, yes, Nathan came and set him straight with the uh, with your the wife, parable okay. about the, the yeah, sheep. about the man with one sheep and the rich man came and took the, the poor man's sheep. But yeah. uh, that was Nathan. Then uh, John the Baptist never wrote anything that we know of. That's not true. There's no books. <laughs> And coming closer to home, we may also talk about, we can also talk about Ellen G. White. She was a woman of God. She did not put anything in the Bible, in the scripture. But her teachings basically aligns with the word of God. She had a full respect of the Bible and believed that the Bible was foundational and uh, central to his to her thoughts and theology. She upholds and supported the great Protestant principles of Reformation. So, how should we relate to new discoveries of documents that claim to be written by non-canonical canonical prophets of God? So I'm going to read the book of Isaiah, verse 20, please. Okay. And Paula, it's your, your turn. My wing, is it Isaiah? Is that what you said, 820? Yeah. Isaiah 820. Okay. Sorry, I got lost there for a while. I lost my connection. Oh, we, we figured it out. I, I tried to throw a text to you and you weren't there to catch it. <laughs> so <laughs> so sorry. Okay. Um, okay. To the law and to the testimony, if they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Ma'am. Clear. The Basically, law of God is the standard. The Bible says. Yes. Go ahead. You test everything but what the Bible says. If something new comes to light, you go back to what is already in the Bible to prove it or disprove it. Yeah, exactly. So the law of God is standard by which all professed communications from the invisible world are to be tested. Somebody tested invisible world, spirit from invisible world in the Bible. That was King Saul. King Saul was destroyed because or condemned because of his jealousy and disobedience of God's rule. Find in 1 Samuel 28, verse 1 to 3, how he tried to speak to the spirit of the dead, especially that of Samuel, when the Philistines came against him. He realized he was helpless without the prophet of God communicating to God and praying over. Mm -hmm against the Philistines coming against them. When we find ourselves helpless like that, it is our responsibility to call upon God because that is the only help we can get through Jesus to rescue or to answer our prayers. Yes. Seventh-day Adventists accept Ellen G. White as a genuine prophet of God how did she view her writing in relation to the Bible? Why is it always appropriate to test her writing by the Bible? Well, she often referred to her own writings as a lesser light that pointed to the greater light. She, correct. Is she actually at one point said that if people were actually studying and reading their Bible, like they should be, there would be no need for her writings at all. 
Absolutely. She always referred. To... Sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. I was just going to say she always referred to scripture too as when she did write. She always, I feel like, backed it up or you know used that as a basis for what she was writing about. Exactly. That's true. Yeah, she also elevated the Bible as the only standard of faith mm -hmm. in support of the reformers. So she strongly believed in that, that reformation was right and the truth. She relied on the Bible, not on her own self. Mm -hmm. So, is there any contribution? Because this is the end of our studies at this hour. Any contribution to make? Tell us. Women of God, any contribution? Uh, you know, to the last uh, question, you know, Mrs. White's writings in many cases were just, as Bob had said, uh, lesser light leading to the greater light, but it was more clarification of different things in the Bible where she had uh, explanatory visions that help guide us and lead us and answer questions that we may have had about the Bible. And it was always about the Bible as in a previous question, Sola Scriptura, it was always a Bible in the Bible alone, which was the ultimate goal of her writing is to bring people closer to God through the Bible and using her writings as more clarification or explanatory about different things. Yeah, I like to, uh, when I read a text, if I'm having a little difficulty, I look to see what she wrote about that text, how yeah. she interpreted it. And because uh, a lot of times she'll refer to other texts at a time mm -hmm. so you can compare uh, and it helps clarify things like what Gary was talking about. Yes. Any other contribution? For those online, we thank you very much for joining us. So we just know that contribution. We have a closing prayer at this time. Shall we pray, please? Father God in heaven, we thank you so much at this, our Lord. We adore you, we glorify your holy name because you are the Father, Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth. Thank you for this Bible study this day, Lord. Father, we pray that you give us the strength to continue to gather on Friday to study your words, encourage one another, Lord. We pray that you have mercy upon each and every one of us. When we depart from this place now, may we not depart from your presence. Remember those that are watching online also that joined us, Father. Bless each and every one of them. Encourage them, strengthen them to bring them more to join us as we continue to study your word. Father divine, may your name and name alone be glorified. And thank you for this day. Lead us aright and watch over us through the night. If there are anyone sick among us, Father, touch them and heal them. Any family member sick, Father, touch and heal them. We cover them with the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus is sufficient for each and every one of us. Father divine, tomorrow, we will be able to go to your holy temple to worship thee in true and in pure and in spirit. Bless our people all over the world, Father. This we ask in the mighty name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And let everyone say, Amen. 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 Good night, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Like a reminder, next next week I'll be back to uh, leading out. Thank you to uh, Elder Jerry and Elder Ofor for filling in for me for a couple of weeks. Give me a little break. I appreciate it. Our study next week will be uh, the Bible and prophecy. It's kind of an intro 
uh, to what we'll be getting into the following week when we start our Revelation study. And just a reminder, uh, when we start the Revelation study on October 8th, I'll be at the church live. So if people want to come there and join me live, uh, that'll be great. We'll still have the Zoom. So internet's already here. So Annabella, you can still join us from the Philippines. I don't expect you to drive to the church. <laughs> <laughs> Although you're welcome if you ever should show up. And uh, then, of course, we'll broadcast it the following days. Now, Oreo will not be with me at church. <laughs> oh. <laughs> staying here. So, okay. So look forward to that. And I'll be sending out um, a resource I have for interpreting uh, Bible symbols, which has a lot of text you can look up to help you decipher symbols. It'll be helpful when we get into Revelation. Okay. All right. Well, happy Sabbath, all. Hopefully, we'll see most of you at church. Good night. Good night, everybody. Thank you. You're welcome. Good night.